bone of Israel. Now, like when we started first and second chronicles, I actually enjoyed myself sharing with you the introduction. Because with the introduction, it gives you a good background. It gives you an idea of what is in store, what is the objective, what is the purpose of the book, who wrote the book, and, and so on and so forth. And so I did likewise for this uh, book of Israel. In fact, Israel and Nehemiah, because they are linked. I will show it to you. So, as we start the book of Israel, let's uh, look at the background. Now, this background. As we look at whole Israel, we start with the background. Now, if you have been following us in, in our study through the books, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, and so on, and you know, even from Judges, the people of God had not been wholly, fully obedient unto the Lord. They, they, they play hide and seek, catch, Okay, la. They, they, they are caught in the situation, they repent, but then after a while they forget about God, they go back to their old ways. So, the punishments that God meted out to His people are progressive, progressively harsh. And this will all promise, this will all promise uh, in the Word, as we have read just now in Leviticus 26. Before that, God was telling them all the things they need to do, you know, Sabbath for this, observe this, observe this. But then in Leviticus 26, the second part, the punishments for disobedience, that means God knew that they will not be obedient in some measure. You follow me? If God knew that His people are totally for Him, the left, chapter 26 will only have the first part, blessings for obedience. But because He knew His people, so there was a second part. Punishments for disobedience. And it went progressive. So we have seen that the people of Israel had lost property because there were occasions when their land were taken. Okay? Then there was also drought and there was famine, shortage of food. Man, I mean, you can look at your own family and they say, got no food, no food to feed your family, it is bad. And it happened. And then there was also disease and loss of health. Well, they all come together. And then the worst, the ultimate punishment was exile. When they had to be evicted from the land, the promised land that God had given to them. And so with that background, we recall why they were sent into exile. Even as we finish with uh, chapter 36 of 2 Chronicles, I gave you the two reasons. The first one was idolatry. They were still idolatrous. They, they were ignoring, forsaking the love of God. God loved them so much. Thou shall not worship any other besides me. But still, they did worship others. So they were idolatrous. So that was one reason. The second reason was they ignored the seven. They were supposed to give the land rest, they did not. So they were taken out so that the land can have its deserved rest. The exile, now, there were two exiles. The first one, the first one happened in 721 BC. That was when the northern tribes were taken away by who? The Assyrians. Okay. Easy. Who went first? A. Who took them first? A. Then who took them the second batch? B. B. Babylon. Okay. A and B. Okay. So the Assyrians took the northern tribes, ten of them, took them out of, 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 of uh, the promised land because they were disobedient. We studied in the book of Kings. How many good kings were there in the northern part of Israel? How many? None. None. Zitan. Don't have. Okay. In the south, there were still five or six. But in the north, none. 
So, that was the first exile. Then, 100 over years later, we find the people of Judah and Benjamin, the southern two tribes, they were also taken away. This was the second exile. And it, they came in three stages. They call, we, we say that, three deportations. So, the first deportation was in 606 BC. Some Bibles put 605, 606, and, but it's around there. So, that first group, when they were of the royal court, remember who went first? What's his name? Jeho A.S., is it? Yes. Jeho A.S. And the royal court, that means the royal family members and uh, they, they, they went. So the, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, thought that if he would bring away the royal the, the key people of the royal family, bring them away up to Babylon, perhaps the people remaining would be obedient and be subject and submit to his rule. But he found that this was not so. This was not so. If, if these people, stiff-necked people, if they did not even obey their Jehovah, why would they obey an earthly king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar? You understand? So they didn't. But anyway, in the first group that went up, in that group, the first deportation, there was who? Daniel, the prophet. He was only a teenager then. Imagine you're a small boy and then you were taken away from your homeland. And that happened to him. Then, the second deportation came in 597 BC. This was because the, the people down in the south were, were, were not in total subjection to the king of Babylon. So he came. And this time, the king of Babylon decided maybe he should take away those people who can make money. Okay, those who are merchants, those who are craftsmen, those who are very uh, you know, useful and skilled people, bring them away from Jerusalem from Judah and take them up north and so the people now will be left without business people without people who can make money without skill people so they will be demoralized and so perhaps they will be a bit more quiet submissive and so on and in the second group of people who were deported there was this Ezekiel okay another prophet which we will study later again the people were not really obedient. Okay. Then in 586, which we just read at the conclusion of this uh, uh, chapter 36, we find that uh, in 586, he came, Babylonians, uh, the king and the rest, they came, they burned down the whole place, they took all the treasures and they brought the people up to Babylon. And that was actually a very sad year in the Jewish, you talk to any Jew and so on, 586 was a sad year because that was the year the temple was torn asana, burned down. Okay, so these were the three deportations of the second exile. And three deportations led to three returns. They came back in three stages. Interesting, not so far. Mm -hmm. This is a bit of history. Otherwise, if you read the whole book, then if you miss here and there, it can be a bit difficult. So, three deportations uh, came three returns. The first one, in 537 BC. Now, 537 BC, if you take 605, 606, 605 minus 537, how many years again? How many years again? The first, the first deportation, 606. And then, 537 BC. The first group of people who came back to Jerusalem. Hey, don't worry, I can 
email to you all. <laughs> it's quite a big file. If not, I, I will definitely post up. You can download from the internet, okay? But you want to copy, your pen go in, carry on. Okay. <laughs> so the first group, how many years? 70. 70. According to the word of God through Jeremiah. This is our God. He made the, he promised and he kept his promise. So 70 years. And the first group of people they came back under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, as we shall study, he was in the line of David's family. So and fifty thousand people came back with him. Was it a lot? Sounds a lot. I can fill our national stadium. But later we shall see if it was a lot. To tell you the truth, there were about 2 million Jews up there by then. 2 million. But out of 2 million, only 50,000 chose to come back. Okay. Led by Jerubbabel. And then we saw the re-establishment of social life. Because when they were in Babylon, you were in a strange land. You know, you know Psalms 137. Psalms 137. If you don't know, you know Boney M? You know the bear? Boney M? Never. I don't know. Psalms 137. By the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down, here we weep, when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away, captive, asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But the sad one is verse 4. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? So, no life. It's not their home. But now, they are coming back to their own country. Their homeland, their promised land. This is now the re-establishment of their social life. And then, in 458 BC, we saw the second return. And this was led by Israel, the priest. And he came with the Levites. And this time, the number of people that he managed to convince and persuade to come with him, huh? only what? Four. Thousand eight. Small. You know why? Because the many Jews who were up in Babylon, they had already established themselves, though it was 70 short years. But the Jews, they are very good business people. They are merchants, they are smart. Even today, you look at all the Nobel Peace uh, winners and, and all the, the, the inventions and so on. A lot of them are Jews. And you don't need to wonder why. Because they are God's chosen people. God bless them. Okay? It's not because they are good, but because God is good. So, these people were so settled there and so on. Uh, no, I don't want to come back. You're cool. Okay. Do you know today, there are more Jews uh, in New York, in US, uh, than there are in Israel. There were so many Jews up in, in Europe before World War II. They were so happy, they were settled, the Rothschild Bank, and, and so They were financially, wow, successful. But after World War II, or during World War II, when they saw what happened, the Holocaust and so on, so they are coming back, even from Ethiopia, Africa. So, anyway, with Israel and the Levites coming back, Israel, priests, and the Levites coming back, they re-established the religious life. Because when they were in a foreign land, there was no altar there was no temple. They cannot observe in the 70 years uh, the worship and the offerings and the sacrifices and, and so they couldn't. But now that they are back with Israel leading the way, 
the re-establishment of the religious life. Then in the third return, say, 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 444 BC, Nehemiah came back and with the craftsmen, the, you know the craftsmen who were taken away in the second deportation? They came back and with it, they rebuilt the walls. For defense, to fortify the, the city and so on. And that was to re-establish the physical life. Okay? I, I must tell you that I, I took a, a number of this reference, all, all these things uh, from uh, David Pawson's book. Okay? David Pawson, this book, Unlocking the Bible, is so thick. Okay? Donated by sister behind it. Yeah. Uh, Christine, Christine, she gave, she gave me that book. Um, not only not only from David Pawson, but also from other resources I, I, I get that and I put them, I summarize, summarize them, put them in a way that you and I can, can understand it simply. Then when you get into the book, and then the book comes alive. Okay? Now this is from David Pawson. He put Israel and Nehemiah together. And you see, until now, when you read Israel and Nehemiah, they did not identify, they did not say who is the author. Whoever wrote did not say, I am the author. So it's not conclusive, but from the patterns and from all this structure of the book, they can almost conclude that very, very likely, possibly, close to definite, the author must be Israel, the priest. If you look at Israel and Nehemiah, David Pawson broke it down for us. Four sections. Okay. Return, rebuild, return, reform. Ten chapters of Israel. In, I mean, all together there are three returns. First return, second return, third return to Jerusalem. Now, in the book of Israel, it covers the first two returns. First two chapters, return one. Then, chapters three to six, it talks about rebuilding. Chapters seven to eight, talks about the second return, return two. And then, reform, reformation, nine and ten. And in the first section, there are two main sections. First two chapters, there are two main sections, three sections. Three sections here and two sections here. And then he compared with Nehemiah. Return, the third return, rebuilding, renewing, then reforming. Again, he noticed there were two sections, three sections, three sections, and two sections. And what's amazing also, in chapter 9 of this book, and chapter 9 of this book, it was about confession, about intercession, where this godly man were interceding for the nation of Israel, Judah, Israel. Okay. So, the pattern are so close, and the pattern of writing also is the same as First and Second Chronicles. First and Second Chronicles. And also, there is Psalms 119, the longest psalm in the book of Psalms, credited to Israel. So, the conclusion is that Israel wrote First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Israel, Nehemiah, and also Psalms 119. So, another great contributor to the work of God. Don't worry, I send all this to you. Then, in the next slide, is the relationship of Nehemiah, no, Israel Nehemiah, to 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Because we just finished 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Now, as we go on to Israel, what is the connection? Is that a link? Of course, there is. 
Too small. Too small. You all can't see. Can't see. Small. Okay, let me read. Huh? My eyes better. Okay, first and second chronicles, Israel Nehemiah. Chronicle ends with the Cyrus Edict. Edict, that means, was the, like the commandment. The, the issuance or instruction that you can go back, we read right 36, you can go back and build the house of God in Jerusalem. So, ended with the Cyrus edict, Israel begins with the Cyrus edict. So, continuity. Chronicles emphasize Jerusalem and the temple. Israel Nehemiah emphasize also Jerusalem and the temple. Same. Chronicles had a priestly focus. Remember? Chronicles is about the altar. It's not about the king, not about the throne. It's about the altar. It's about the priest restoring the worship and returning to the world. Israel is more focused on the law itself. So now he has moved from priestly. He focused now on the law in Israel. Chronicles is more focused on Davidic hierarchy leadership, no, Davidic leadership, suggesting composition around the time of Zerubbabel and so on. So in Chronicles, talk about the succession of kings and so on. Uh, but here, not so. That's not the focus. Chronicles omits Solomon's downfall due to intermarriage. In Chronicles, God didn't even talk about David's sin. And don't want to look at the back, highlight the good. And in Nehemiah, Nehemiah appealed to Solomon as a negative example. So if you go all the way to the last chapter of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was telling the people, look, Solomon, bad example, don't follow him. He, he, he was womanizing and this and that. Don't follow him. So, and also, Nehemiah, Israel, Nehemiah contains unique first-person memoirs. Because in the book, example, in the book of Israel, there are ten chapters. The first six chapters describes, you know, like in the third person. But when we come to chapter seven of Israel, he wrote, the author wrote, I, I. So he was giving a personal account. So the person who wrote, the thing, this, this, this book, he started, I, he did not identify himself, but he was using first person. So, you know, it's a very personal account. So, you put all this together, you know, it must be someone who was there, who was present at that point in time. And reading all this, the conclusion is Israel. Okay, now, we, I brought from a broad uh, perspective down Nehemiah, Israel, Nehemiah. Now we go to specifically Israel, the book of Israel. So, the book of Israel, what is it about? It is about the last of the historical books. In fact, in the Hebrew text, uh, they have got first Israel, second Israel. But they have bound it together. Now it's one, Israel. So, last of the historical books. Because it traced the history of these people coming back. And what did they do? It is the story of God's work to fulfill His promises by bringing His people back from exile and establishing them again in their land. That was His promise. We read Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah 29. He promised he will bring them back. And this book is about God fulfilling his promise. It covers the first and the second returns, as I mentioned earlier. Nehemiah covered the third. Now, this book was written partly in Hebrew and partly in Aramaic. Aramaic. Now, that was the lingua franca. You know, understand lingua franca. That was the main language. Like today, uh, the main language is English. But maybe one day, soon, it will be joke war. We don't know. No world, no. Uh, Chinese empire. So, But then, in 
in in that time the lingua franca with these people up in Babylon in that region Babylon that region the lingua franca was Aramaic and so though they were Hebrews I mean I mean you bring your mate and your mate works here whether from Cambodia or from, from uh, in uh, what yeah Indonesia Philippines after work the mate can also speak Cantonese right mm -hmm. learn something uh, yeah so in this book, some were written in Hebrew, their own language, and also some in Lingua, in, 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 in Arabic. Now, the book of Daniel, likewise. The book of Daniel, likewise. Now you will understand why the book of Daniel also has Hebrew and Arabic. Because Daniel was taken into exile in the first deportation, and he stayed there 70 years. So he is a is familiar with the language and the culture. Bound as one book, first and second Isra, and then the writing, as mentioned earlier, similar to first and second Chronicles. Storyline. Oh, when can we get started? I think next week. Uh. Okay, but background is important. Info. So Israel. The northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians and they ceased to exist. You know, as we as we read from here onwards, uh, as we read from here onwards, nothing is mentioned of the ten tribes. It's all about the southern tribes coming back, restoring Jerusalem and so on. That's why in in, in some uh, scholar papers and, and other comments, you know what they say? The ten lost tribes. Have you come across that? The ten lost tribes. Let me tell you, they are not lost. Because they are still God's people. They are maybe scattered, but they are not lost. You read all the way to Revelation in the last days. The twelve tribes, the twelve tribes are mentioned there, they are not lost. But for this season, for that season and, and, and until now, the focus is on the southern. So after the north came the south, the Ju Judah southern kingdom, they fell to the Babylonians and they were captive for 70 years. Then Babylon fell to Persia. Remember? I mentioned earlier. Fell to Persia. So King Cyrus is King Cyrus of Persia. So Nebuchadnezzar is history. Then the Persian king Cyrus ended the captivity which we read just now, the Cyrus Edict. Let them go. And then Israel and Nehemiah led the restoration. God now used Israel and Nehemiah to go back and bring about reformation, restore the land. The outline, this is a broad outline. Huh? I give you, I break the book, the book into uh, two parts. Chapters 1 to 6, and then chapters 7 to 10. No, I, this is from David Pawson. So, chapters 1 to 6, the key character we find in the first part of that book, Israel, was Jeru Babel. And 50 people came back with him. And in that first part of Israel, the emphasis was on the restoration of the temple. So it involved building and construction and so on and so forth. In the second part of this book, chapters 7 to 10, the key character was Israel. And within were two, about 1,008, 2,000 people. And it was about the reformation of the people getting the people to return to the word of God as well, uh, the, the revival in the, in the nation and, and the instruction to the people and so on. That was in the second part of Israel. Now I give you a more detailed breakdown of the first six chapters since we are starting with the first six chapters, right? Okay, this, this, one, no, this one is this one is no, this one, I already pointed out to you. Don't worry, these are just content pages, don't worry. This is return number one, review, return number two. Okay, so this one is 
extra okay? skip this the, this one breaking down the first six chapters and with this we will start next week okay chapter one the king proclaiming which king cyrus just did he proclaimed you can go quite different from the pharaoh no pharaoh many years ago many many years ago you cannot go but king cyrus said go. the king proclaiming now what i do is i write at the beginning of each and every chapter i write the, the title that so is so that gives me an introduction to that chapter the second chapter is the people reclaiming their genealogy because they have been scattered now that they are back who is who are you a scribe no I, are you a levite are you a priest are you from from, from the tribe of, of whatever benjamin judah the people reclaiming their theology the word the word okay, what did god say and then while they were trying to rebuild as Satan came to disturb them, the enemy came to defame, defame them, discourage them. And then chapter five, the Lord sustained them prophetically. So through prophecies, God encouraged them, God sustained them. And then the Lord sustaining them politically in chapter six. So. So, the, just to show you a couple of maps, okay, um, this, we will look into greater detail, this is about Daniel's vision, the Persians and so on, but I just want to show you this, the Persian Empire at the time of Israel, the Persian Empire at the time of Israel, I mean, just see, all green, that was how how big the empire was. And so when the king said, you can go, who would then stop? But for this to happen, you must know, it is divine intervention. No man would just simply say, okay, like you Because they just, I mean, Satan did, doesn't like the Jews until today. But here, God used a Gentile king and said, let the people go. And he did. This is the, this is the, just now, earlier we showed the maps of deportation. This is now the map of return. So, they were in Babylon. So the first return, they went about the same direction. Up there, Aleppo, and then come down to Jerusalem. Second batch. No, this one 50,000. Second batch smarter, take shortcut. So, <laughs> Round here. Again, here they come because this is the desert. desert. So if you stay a bit longer, I'll show you where's the third one. <laughs> so Father, we want to thank you for your presence here. We thank you, Lord, for Israel, for penning all this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for our benefit. And so, Lord, we can see, indeed, it is blessings for obedience and punishment for disobedience. Lord, we choose to be obedient and help us as we walk, as we sojourn on this earth. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.